بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربش رحلي صدري ويسلي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه القول Brothers and sisters in Islam and in creation Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I begin in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful. All praise belongs to Him. The one who creates, but is not created. The one who sees, but is unseen. The one who gives and takes life away, but is ever living. And the one who gave us the best example for us to follow, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says in His beautiful book, the Quran, Sir Yusuf, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The brief translation of this verse is in, he turned away and said, Oh, my sorrow over Joseph. And his eyes became white from grief. And for he it was that of a suppressor. Suppressor meaning suppressing his grief. So today we're all gathered here for the day of Arba'in. We've been commemorating since the beginning of the month of Muharram the tragedy that befell Imam Hussein and the household of the Prophet. You know, we, we reflect and we look. We look at the way we commemorate. We hold gatherings. We all get together. We, we cry. We mourn. And this is something that's been going on for many generations. And this has been a very powerful tool for bringing people together and for bringing about movements in the Islamic world. We know, for example, shortly after Imam Hussein was murdered, many years later, the revolution of Mukhtar started. And there was other movements. I mean, we don't, there's no need to get into complete detail, but there's other movements in the Islamic world that later started because of Imam Hussein. And in fact, the, when the Abbasids and Umayyads started fighting one another, one of the excuses that the Abbasids used was what happened to Imam Hussein. So, and this, and they were able to, unfortunately, they were able to deceive some people into thinking that the Abbasids were really intent on helping the followers of Ahlul when they merely used this as a trick to gain into power. So this is something for us to reflect on. And just to note that this, the azad, the power of this, is something that can, you know, move hearts and can break down walls. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Now, unfortunately, many times while we cry for Imam Hussein, which we should, and we cry for the tragedy that befell us, what about personal tragedies that we as humans beings face? You know, when people face depression, people face anxiety. You know, a lot of times we have a knee-jerk reaction where we try to sweep it under the rug that oh, mental health is not a concern or issue. But if we learn and take the examples of the Prophet Ahlul Bayt, we'll learn that they themselves did not you know, suppress any form of expressing grief or mourning. But unfortunately, when, we, when members of our community, our friends, relatives, they face personal tragedies, we have a tendency to do that. We'll say things like, you know, suck it up or man up or you know, get over it. And we give very, very simple answers to complex trauma that people might be facing. And what's interesting is for, for those of you in this audience who might be therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, the theories that you learn when it comes to dealing with grief mourning, a lot of these, a lot of these theories, applications were things that were taught by the example and the sayings of the Prophet Ahlul Let's first turn to the example of Prophet Muhammad, the best example for us. Now, first and foremost, I'd like to go over a misconception that exists among certain, certain schools of thought from our other brothers and sisters and other schools of thought in Islam. There is a, there's some, and again, not all, but there's some who narrate a tradition that say, you know, you grieve for three days and that's it, done, over, uh, that's a khalas, you know, no more. And that if you do any more, that the person who is buried will somehow suffer in the grave. And, and this contradicts Islamic history. What do I mean? When the Prophet suffered the loss of two of his earliest allies and people who were close to him, Abu Talib and Sayyidah Khadija, what did he do? Did he just mourn for three days and move on? No. 
He declared the year as a year of grief. Whenever, and even when Sayyid Hamza, when he was murdered in Uhud, what did he do? He arranged for women to mourn the death of Sayyid Hamza. So it's very, it's, for us, a lot of times, if we look to the seerah of the Prophet, we'll find solutions. If we look to the Quran, we'll find a lot of these answers and solutions to problems that exist amongst us. And we can learn from their particular examples if we study and reflect. So let's go, so let's go back to the Prophet. After, after his beloved wife, Sayyidina Khadija salam, passed away, he would constantly remember her. He would be very sad, and he would fondly remember her and for the sacrifices that she made for the religion of Islam, not only with her wealth, but with her time, with the love that she also gave to the Prophet. So much so, like in later years, you know, sometimes some of his wives would get jealous of the remembrance he had for Sayyidina Khadija. So one time, one of the wives, said, got very jealous and said, you know, Allah has given you better wives than uh, Sayyidah Khadija. And then this got the Prophet visibly very angry. And he said, no one was better than Khadija. She believed in me when everyone else abandoned me. And she supported me. And so afterwards, this, these, some of these wives, they learned not to mention anything ill of Sayyidah Khadija. So the Prophet always in his heart and his mind always had this remember, remembrance of Sayyidah Khadija. He was always, he, was, he, would, you know, he would cry, he would remember the, the different things that she used to do for him. In fact, we all know the story, when the Prophet entered the city of Medina, they all welcomed him. We know, you've heard the stories of the Nasheed that's played, and you know, people with the camel guiding him to the house, and everyone saying, please, please come to our house. We all know the story of Medina. Some narrations state that he went, when he went to Mecca, you know, some people were also, you know, saying, you know, please, after Allah gave him victory in Mecca, people were also saying, you know, come, stay in our place. But according to some narrations, he didn't do that. What did he do instead? Some narrations state what he did, the first thing that he did when he entered Mecca and he became victorious, rather than stay at a particular companion's place, he erected a tent and stayed near the grave site of Sayyidah Khadija. So this was the love and devotion that he had to say the Khadija. Now let's look at the example of Imam Zainal Abdi'in. His grief was ongoing. This ver the verse of the Quran that I recited earlier is analogous to, and it's part of the response that Imam Sajjad gave to, interestingly enough, Abu Hamza Tamal. Abu Hamza Tamal, we know, is known for the dua that he that you know a very long du'a and for collecting his du'a that we have, but he it said it is narrated that he went up to Imam Sajjad and said you know what you know many years have uh, transpired since the tragedy of Karbala you know why do you keep crying why do you keep remembering you know I'm basically paraphrasing what the conversation that would happen between them, so Imam Sajjad responded and said he brought up the issue of Imam of Nabi Yaqub by some Jacob he said Jacob cried for years and years, and he went blind out of crying. Yet he knew that Nabi Yusuf was alive. But I witnessed the murder of my father and my brothers in front of me. So how can you expect me not to cry? So this is, again, this is an example of Imam Sajjah turning to, using the Quran as an example for exemplifying what he was. We know that Quran and Ahlul Bayt go together. So many times when the prophet imams, they would have dialogue. Later on, the imams in particular, they would have dialogue with people. They would always bring, they would bring up the Quran as a reference point. And indeed, it is a very powerful reference point for us to use as many beautiful themes. And it is very important for us to reflect on this. Salaam Muhammad wa Muhammad So Imam Sajjah, whenever he would go to a butcher, he would ask the butcher, he would say, did the animal have anything to eat before it was killed? And the butcher said, yes, son of the prophet. He said, my father was denied water, denied food, before he was mercilessly, mercilessly slaughtered. So what are, what are some important lessons we can gather from this? One of the most important lessons 
is that when somebody is facing a particular tragedy, don't just tell them to say, get over it, or, you know, you know, you know we unfortunately we have this attitude when people are suffering different tragedies. And mental health is a very, very a serious issue that we don't give enough attention to. It's very important that we advise, we support these people who are suffering these different challenges and not simply brush off the particular challenges that they're facing. And shortly, I'll go over some methodologies that are from the example of the Prophet Ahlul Bayt and that is substantiated by you know, therapists, social workers, and psychologists and psychiatrists in terms of dealing with these different challenges after you give me a salawat. The first lesson is dua, praying. If you look at the collection of dua in as sahifa there are so many different dua for this occasion. Du dua for loneliness, dua for grief, dua for sustenance. So one of the ways that Imam Sajjad used to deal with his agony and his pain was to engage in dua. So this is something for us when we're facing tragedy, we're facing difficult times. Turn to dua. Listening to the dua kumail, for example, very powerful when you're facing sadness and tragedy. The other dua is sahifa. Very, this is a very powerful gift and legacy that Ahlul Bayt has left us. Also, you know, when you're alone, you have solitude, just having conversation between you and Allah. You know, Allah says He's closer to us in our own jugular veins. What does that mean? It means, one of the meanings anyway, is that we should be able to express, and we do need to express our own feelings and talk. We need to have this ongoing conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and tell Allah about our pain, our joys, you know, rather than simply relegate it to the five daily prayers. And yes, obviously the five daily prayers are important, and it's a form of dua and praying in itself. But dua outside the five daily prayers, having this constant connection to Allah through dua. I mean, taqwa, one of the meanings of taqwa is having God consciousness, God-centeredness. It doesn't simply mean, you know, just being strict and following ahkam. It's being conscious of Allah so that wherever you are, whatever you're thinking, whatever you're doing, Allah is first and foremost in your thought. So one of this, one of the ways is by having this conversation, simply before going to sleep, getting up, pleading to Allah with whatever problems and fears that you have, because he's a samir. He's always listening. It's very important for us to plead to him. Number two, <coughs> be thankful for whatever little it is that you have. Despite the tragedy that Ahlul Bayt faced, they would always express thankfulness to Allah. They would not, not once would they say anything negative towards Allah. They would not, they would not have, be like, oh Allah, why did this happen to us? Or anything of that nature. Yes, they would talk about the injustices that were perpetrated, but this was to the crimes of human beings. This was not a reflection of their of any kind of anger towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were always thankful. They would, you know, whatever whatever the situation in life was, they always maintained thankfulness to Allah. So it's very important that whatever our circumstances, be thankful for whatever little it is that you have. Number three, participate in a meaningful ritual and morning ceremony. For, the, for those of you who are familiar with mental health, you know that when it comes to, for example, an issue like PTSD, one of the stages of healing, they say, is to have remembrance and mourning. Now, it's interesting that, you know, a science evidentiary-based practice is discovering these things right now, but if you look at the example of Prophet Ahlul Bayt, he did these things thousands of years ago. After the tragedy of Karbala, Sayyid Zainab, in Damascus, organized all these group gatherings to remember the sacrifice of Muhammad II. In fact, after the members of Ahlul Bayt returned to Medina, even then, they would have remembrance of Ahlul Bayt <coughs> and Imam Hussein and the sacrifices that they faced. So for us, in clinical terms, you, you can call this as a form of psychosocial support. So it's very important when somebody is facing any kind of difficulty, don't leave them alone. That's very, very, that's very dangerous and it can lead to very uh, negative consequences. It's very important collectively as a community to come and support that individual for them to encourage them to seek assistance. Like you have the group therapy, you have uh, you know these different programs where people can talk about their problems. So seek clinical and professional assistance. And again, this is from the example of the Prophet in Ahlul Bayt. Salam Muhammad wa Muhammad
and make sure to create sometimes we ourselves need a particular ritual that's unique to us in our own way of dealing with our grief more. I mean this you know this collective way is very important and something that we need to do as a part and parcel methodology of dealing with grief and mourning and remembering Imam Hussein. But again, we need to take we need to derive the lessons from Akhulay rather than simply see it as a ritualized thing that we're doing. There's a wisdom be behind whatever the Akhulay did, so this is something that we need to implement. Number four, volunteer. So I briefly spoke about this yesterday. I had mentioned that you know you know go to like your local soup kitchen, go to your you know, domestic violence shelters, whatever this place might, the places might be. Now look at the example of Imam Sajjad What did he do? After the tragedy of Karbala, and he returned to Medina, he would still keep himself busy with helping the poor people in Medina. He would, just like his grandfather and his father, they would go from house to house in the night, covered, the face, faces covered, and deliver food to the poor people of Medina. This is what Imam Sajjad, despite what had happened to Imam Sajjad, this is what he kept doing. There's a story when Imam Sajjad went for Hajj. And he there was a group of people who, you know, he was looking to serve. And he went incognito to Hajj. And there was a group of people and he volunteered. He was taking care of their needs and serving them. And you know, many of us sometimes we see those kinds of individuals, and those types of individuals should be role models for us. And so he's helping these individuals. And one of the companions of Imam Sajjad, who, you know, happened to come upon this later, saw this, and he got very angry at the, the, these people. He said, woe to you. Don't you know who this is? This is the grandson of the prophet, and you're allowing, allowing him to serve you? And so, the, you know, these people, they didn't know that this was Imam Sajjad, so they, they were like, oh, no, no, we can't let you serve us anymore. So it was Imam Sajjad's reaction to this. Imam Sajjad turned to his friend, and he said, why did you tell them who I was? He said, now that they know who I am, they're not going to let me serve them anymore and they miss out on the benefits. So again, Imam Sajjad kept himself busy with all these different things. He kept himself busy with du'a. He kept himself busy with helping those who were less fortunate in Medina. So again, this is another way of dealing with tragedy when it befalls us. And last, and certainly not least, sabr, patience. In Allah Ma'at Sabir, this is something that we say constantly. This is a verse from the Quran, and we like to say that, yeah, yes, it's very easy to say that Allah is with the patient. But what do we do? I mean, when something afflicts us, are we really patient? Or are we basically internally, and I include myself in this category, are we saying, you know, God, what did I do to deserve this? You know, why, you know, woe is me? And, you know, we have, we have these different uh, feelings that go across in our minds. But this never happened to Imam Sajjad. Imam Sajjad was, always patient, as was say the Zainab. They did not complain to Allah. They bore their, uh, they bore their patience. They, they were very patient with the tragedies that befell them. And there's a story when Imam Zain al-Abidin was taking from place to place. And as their journey from Iraq to eventually to Damascus was concluding, along the way, there was a man, a very cruel man, who wanted to tease Imam Sajjad. So he had a cup of water. You know, this is Imam Sajjad happened to be thirsty. So the man said, you want water? He started pulling the water in front of him. He said, there's your water. So he insulted Imam Sajjad that way. Imam Sajjad didn't say a word. Just kept quiet, just smiled. Many years later, the tables had turned and this man was on the run. And he happened to be in Medina. And so one night, this man was running desperately. He was thirsty himself. He comes across, across a man who offers him water. And he takes the water. And then he looks at him. He's oh, like, Sajjad. wow. He's like, it's, it's not even a Hussein. And then he goes to him. He says, do you know who I am? And Imam goes, I know very well who you are. And then the man started you know, crying, being remorseful for what he had done. Again, the, this is the example of Ahlul Bayt. So the thing that we need to take away from this is we need to look at ourselves internally and we need to look at ourselves with mercy to other individuals. Internally, we need to constantly work on 
try, trying to, whenever we face difficulties, these are the things that we want to implement upon ourselves, the dua, the being, participating in group activities, uh, support, maintaining patience, volunteering, and collectively we want to be able to do this. We have a community responsibility to support those who are suffering from these problems and not to leave them alone, not to say, no, just get over it or, you know, move on or, you know, unfortunately we have a tendency to do this because we ourselves don't know how to deal with it. So this is a very easy and knee-jerk response that we give to people who are suffering from mental illness, you know, mental health problems, I should say. You know, PTSD, you know, when people suffer trauma traumatic incidents, it takes a while for them to get over it. You know, there's, it takes, th it takes therapy, it takes many different things. So again, I just want to give a reminder to anyone, if anybody in the community is suffering from depression, anxiety, PTSD, these types of things, seek the assistance of a professional mental professional. Salam ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Allahumma salli 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 ala
who also died along the way. Not to mention what had happened to the women along the way. One of the narrations state when the tents were set up, one of the daughters who was left behind in Medina, Fatima Hussein, Sayyidah Fatima Sukhra, she came upon this tent where the women were, and she asked, where is my sister Ruqayya Sakina? And then when she finally learned the truth, she was in disbelief and she fainted. And then Ahlul Bayt and the members of Ahlul Bayt kept continuing their remembrance. And one of the most powerful forms of remembrance that happened was Umm al -Banin. Umm al -Banin kept the message alive as well. So much so that she was even able to make the tyrant of that time, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, the enemy of Islam, cry. What Umm al banin would do is she would go to Jannat al baqi and she would write very powerful poetry, very sad poetry, talking about her situation. And not things to the effect that I'm not Umm al banin anymore. You know, she lost her, she had lost her son. This poetry had such an impact that Marwan ibn al-Hakam would come and listen to it. Marwan ibn al-Hakam. For those of you who don't know who Marwan ibn al-Hakam was, one of the biggest enemies of Ahlul Bayt, all the way dating from the time of the Prophet. And this meant he did whatever he could to make the life of Ahlul Bayt miserable. He was the one who told his governor in Medina Walid to kill Imam Hussein. He was the one who constantly instigated the troubles against Imam Ali during the, when Imam Ali was the Khalifa. And here he is as a short-term ruler in Medina, when he was in Medina, listening to Umm al and, and the pain that she's going through, so much so that a tyrant like him wound up crying. Assalamu ala al Hussein. Wa Ali ibn al Hussein. Wa ala awrad al Hussein. Wa ala ashab al Hussein. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, sisters, if you join me in dua, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. O Allah, please forgive us for all of our sins. Ya Ghafar, Ya Tawab. Ya Allah, many of us are suffering from financial distress financial difficulties, please grant us sustenance. Ya Razak, Ya Ghani. Ya Allah, we are all seeking to get closer to you and gain knowledge and to be able to deal with the trials that have beset us with the current political climate and Islamophobia. Ya Muhaymin, Ya Aziz, Ya Jabbar, please protect us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, when Imam Mahdi comes, let us be with him and not those who are against him. Thank you again. Salaam Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.